big data. In particular, I think that images and video are an important frontier for computational social science research. Um, I think we're in a particularly interesting uh, moment here due to two converging trends. First, over the past decade or so, we've seen the huge breakthroughs in the use of machine learning techniques to study images. In particular, convolutional neural networks trained on large data sets have been able to classify images with relatively high accuracy. And I think most importantly for social scientists, transfer learning, which I'm sure you'll hear more about, allows us to adapt a pre-trained model to a new task with relatively little new compute required. And second, our social life is increasingly mediated by images and video. We use platforms like Instagram, Facebook, and TikTok to interact with others, present ourselves, and to understand the world. And we cannot understand online social life simply by studying text and digital traces. Billions of new images and countless hours of video are being produced every day by individuals, corporations, and governments and other actors. And these computer vision techniques provide us with a way to use these data to understand social, political, and economic processes. I'm really excited to introduce the four panelists who are all at the forefront of these advances and I look forward to learning from them today. First, we have Bryce Dietrich, who is an assistant professor of social science informatics at the University of Iowa. Bryce uses an array of different data, including text, audio, and images to study nonverbal political behavior at both the mass and elite levels. Laura Nelson is assistant professor of sociology at Northeastern University. And Laura has published articles on the use of computational methods and big data for sociological research, emphasizing the importance of integrating these approaches with complementary qualitative interpretative methods. Michelle Torres is an assistant professor of political science at Rice University. Michelle uses computer vision and machine learning to study the media framing of the Black Lives Matter movement and has several projects focused on making these methods more accessible to social scientists. Finally, Han Zhang is assistant professor at the Hong Kong University of Science and Technology. He has used computer vision to detect collective action events in Chinese social media, an approach that's particularly fruitful in authoritarian contexts where we cannot rely solely on media reports. So I'd like to begin the panel discussion by asking each of the panelists to tell us a little more about how they're using computer vision techniques in their research. So Bryce, if you'd like to uh, take it away. Okay, uh, yes, uh, thanks Tom and uh, all the rest of the organizers for having me. Really excited about this panel uh, because I think image and video data is going to become more synonymous with social science research as we progress. And so I'm excited to see where this data and subfield uh, stands uh, with the fellow panelists. Um, so I have a lot of projects that deal with image and video data. Uh, so I definitely have interest in combining image, text, and audio data into common algorithms. But I'm going to set that aside for the purposes of this discussion and instead focus on this basic question of people moving in space, how do we measure it and what is the political implications of said measures? Um, sorry, let me see here. Okay, um, specifically how people position themselves relative to others is often indicative of underlying predispositions and consequently can help us better understand their political behavior. So I have three projects, uh, one of which is out in political analysis that all use this basic premises, a premise to understand elite and uh, mass political behavior. So in the political analysis piece, I essentially used uh, 1,400 hours of C-SPAN footage uh, that occurred between floor votes in the House of Representatives. And ultimately, I found that when members of Congress literally crossed the aisle, i.e. moved from one side of the floor to the other, that it's indicative of future party votes on that day. And if you were to aggregate that measure uh, over the course of a Congress that is actually highly correlated with party polarization over time. 
So the reason why I begin with the study is that in this, uh, in this study, I essentially used difference between frames. So I essentially compared frames as a basic measure of motion. So this is a very basic measure that can be used in a variety of different formats. But the key is to try to find an empirical application that it uh, not only works from a substantive standpoint, but methodologically as well. Uh, so the second piece I'll talk about is a paper that will soon be under review that uses traffic camera feeds from London uh, leading up to the 2015 general election. So there's approximately 768 cameras that we scrape data from uh, the day before the election and the day of the election. And ultimately we found that traffic cameras which have more pedestrians on election day as compared to the previous day generally have significantly higher turnout or is predictive of turnout. And I think most importantly, that you can use these traffic camera based measures as early as 9 a.m. and ultimately predict the outcome of the election. So in the UK, this is especially important because UK polling data or uh, exit polls are not released in real time as they would be in the United States. They're released much later in the day. So I think that traffic cameras is not only a way to uh, potentially harness a new measure that could be useful on election day, but also it can help validate election results in a more systematic fashion. So the third project I'll talk about is a project with Melissa Sands, where uh, we essentially, again, use traffic camera data. But instead of counting or trying to identify voter turnout, instead what we did was we randomly placed uh, Confederates on city sidewalks in New York. Uh, half the time, those Confederates were African-Americans. Half the times, they were white. And then we ended up tracking individual pedestrians, around 3,000, 3,500 pedestrians across both of these sidewalks. And we ultimately found that pedestrians moved around four inches further away when black Confederates were present on the sidewalks as compared to white Confederates. So this is another way to think about how uh, people moving in space can be something that we can study and also something that we can study in a sizable uh, empirical fashion using this type of data set. So um, one thing I'll talk about, uh, I'm not gonna skip some of these challenges because I think they're gonna come up later in the questions, but one thing I wanna mention is that when you're introducing new methodology and new measures, validation is a really large challenge because a lot of these measures, people don't really know what to make of them. So when I say that somebody moves four inches away, is that high or low, uh, relatively speaking? So in an experimental design, this is, this is easier because you're just trying to estimate a treatment effect. But in observational work, this becomes particularly challenging. And I found that agent-based modeling is a really good way to try to get at what these underlying measures mean from a substantive standpoint. The, great, the best example of this is, again, in this paper using uh, New York City streets. One thing I basically worked on all last semester was essentially creating 3D renderings of the experimental locations that use the exact same cameras that we use in our site. And what these allow us to do is essentially manipulate the movement of pedestrians on these sidewalks and say, OK, if, if the pedestrian moves, let's say, five inches further uh, when this particular treatment is present versus another, what is that going to look like when it's manifested in the video data? It also allows us to rotate the camera. So we move from a three-dimensional representation, which is what you see in A, to a two-dimensional represent representation in uh, panel B, which is much easier to estimate a treatment effect because things like the lens length, the zoom rate, et cetera, is not going to estimate the, is not going to affect the distance measures that you're ultimately using. And when we did this, we found that the measure that we use in the study is essentially identical, yields the exact same treatment effects to pick regardless of whether or not you use this original view or the bird's eye view. So with that said, I'll turn it over to the other panelists. Happy to answer additional questions about thinking about motion and people uh, positioning themselves vis-a-vis -vis others. And I'm interested to hear the rest of the panelists' work. Thanks. Uh, thanks, I'll go next. I'm excited to be here and agree with all of Tom's uh, kind of setup on why we should be studying image analysis and, and videos. It's so, so important for social scientists to take this up, I think. So I come at this um, from two points of view. Uh, one is that I, as Tom said, I like to integrate computational and qualitative methods. So this project does that as well. And I, I want to take the perspective of many different people. So not just look at who's what's on Instagram, but what people think about what is posted on Instagram and how they're reacting to it. So that's where I'm coming from. So it's a combination of computational uh, machine vision analysis and qualitative analysis. So the substantive area is how images, how neighborhoods are represented online. So with the increased sharing of images, 
because we live in an unequal society, it's both propping up inequalities and has the potential to challenge inequalities, right? We have the if they gun me down hashtag from uh, following the Ferguson uh, movement, the, the early Black Lives Matter movements where people were posting images of themselves that they would want posted if they were killed by police violence. So the, medias were post the media was posting pictures of people with guns or wads of cash and this movement that if they gun me down kind of hashtag said, why don't you post, post a picture of me in a graduation gown or with my kid or at a family barbecue? So it was this attempt to take back the representation of how people are shown online. And so I'm really interested in how that kind of give and take, who gets to control the image of a group of people and who and how are people kind of fighting back against that. And neighborhood representation is really important from the, the gentrification literature. We know that the image of a neighborhood, the presentation of a neighborhood can be more important than the actual facts of a neighborhood for things like investment. So if a neighborhood is projected as being a bad neighborhood, it's going to get less investment regardless of what's actually going on in that neighborhood. So how neighborhoods are represented online is actually quite consequential materially, but also ideologically and for the people living there. So I partnered with a qualitative research at Rutgers University, uh, Jeff Lane, he's in the communications department. He has done years of ethnographic participant observation and interview work in Harlem. He wrote a book called Digital Streets where he's looking at the interaction between these urban communities and the way that they deal with social media. And so I want to combine kind of my ability to do large computational analyses with his really deep knowledge of that neighborhood to look at how Harlem, in this case Harlem, because that's where Jeff's expertise is, how Harlem is represented online by different communities. Let me just show some pictures here. This works. So the computational part of this is um, initially is in we can use clustering techniques, which we know very well in text analysis, to look at themes across images. So I obtained, I scraped all the Flickr images that have the hashtag Harlem in it. So it's a couple thousand images. And then I use machine vision techniques to cluster these images to look for themes. Um, I used Flickr because one of the biggest challenges, which we'll talk about later in my eyes, is obtaining access to data. Instagram just, they don't allow access to data. So I love to use Instagram. Instagram wasn't available. So I'm using thick Flickr here to, to cluster these images. So you can see you're not meant to see these individual images, but you're meant to see kind of themes. So when I clustered images tagged with the hashtag Harlem, you see here concert venues. Um, here's like building facades, a theme of building facades. This is built in natural environment, including um, landmarks in Harlem. We have kind of individual people, portraits, people on the street, people in groups. So these, these were some of the major themes we were seeing, seeing in the Flickr images. And these represent the way that usually non-Harlem residents other people are coming to Harlem, taking pictures, posting them on Flickr and saying, hey, this is Harlem. So the second step, which is what we're embarking on now, is then to present these pictures to Harlem residents and say, hey, does this actually represent Harlem to you? What do you see when you see these pictures? So from the clustering, we pulled out individual pictures and we're gonna present them with sets of pictures. So here is concert venues and then say, do these pictures represent Harlem to you? Why or why not? And we'll do this with a bunch of different pictures. So this is kind of street scenes from Harlem. Do these pictures represent Harlem? Why or why not? The building pictures, present them with these pictures. What's going on here? What do you think about them? Um, it's kind of building facades and, and landmarks. And then these portraits. So these groups of pictures were selected from the computational clustering of the images from Flickr that we then present to the actual residents of Harlem saying, it, what do you think about these? Do these represent Harlem to you? And then a third step, which we're, we're still kind of getting the things together for, is then to ask them to upload their own pictures to us and say, if you were to represent Harlem, they can use their Instagram or their own camera roll. If you were to represent Harlem, what would you upload? What pictures would you use? And tell us why, followed by in-depth interviews about why they're posting those pictures. So this attempt to get at multiple perspectives on this question, combining this kind of deep ethnographic approach, interview approach with my more distant learning or distant distant viewing um, computational approach. So that's how I'm using images in my data. I will turn it over to Michelle.
Okay, thank you so much, Laura. Uh, and uh, let me, for some reason, I see the chat here all the time. Here. Okay. Um, thanks so much uh, for having me as well. I'm really, really excited to be here and to share my experience and my research uh, when using uh, images as data, especially when we're trying to answer uh, social science questions. Um, uh, I've been fascinated for a very long time now with very iconic images and the power that a photo has to really change people's minds about the particular event or actually to form an opinion about political phenomena. So this is one of those iconic images that is considered to have uh, catalyzed uh, change, one of the biggest change, if not the biggest change in, in US history uh, with respect to the civil rights movement and how one picture was able to move hearts and minds uh, to show a different reality, to show a different perspective from same event um, and that push for change. So, uh, and, and, and I love collecting these books with with all of these images that have changed the world in a way, but um, we constantly see them. This is not only in the past, this is not only about editorial pictures. Um, as Laura was saying, we, we are constantly encountering these images that are moving and mobilizing people. And especially with respect to social movements, I am very interested in analyzing the power that an image can have in shaping those opinions and also in understanding how those images are created and how are they distributed and what kind of things uh, we as an audience are consuming with respect to visual content. Um, this is particularly important uh, given some of the things that Tom said, right? Like we are uh, constantly exposed and bombarded with images. And the interesting thing that images have is that uh, the way in which we process them is very different than other sources like text. And in a way it's much easier and it goes through unconscious cognitive paths that make them particularly powerful. Um, these images are gonna provide a shape, shape information, this idea of like you see to believe. And uh, in my research, I focus mostly on how we are using them or how media, for example, uses them to frame a story in a given way according to their particular interest or a, uh, according to their particular agenda. So, so uh, a classical example I, I generally use to motivate my research because it, in reality, that's what happened. I started seeing all of these newspaper covers and newspaper articles that had the exact same text taken from a news wire source, providing the exact same facts through text, but using different images. And the variance that you can see in the content of these images, um, in this case about the Black Lives Matter movement protest, is really wide in terms of uh, the people depicted there, the environment, the mood of the event they are showing, and even the level of violence, which is a theme that I am particularly interested. So here, for example, again, you have the exact same text, text in the four newspaper covers that I'm going to show you, but you have um, uh, these very different images. Here, it's just a group of people. Here, you see the heavily armed police in a different context, right, during the day. Uh, here, you see tension between the police and the protesters. And for example, this very iconic image when you show a lot of chaos and a lot of conflict, right? So um, I am interested in analyzing that variance, first of all. Um, on uh, understanding what kind of content uh, news outlets are, are using to cover protests, and at the end, whether these visual framing matters for the way in which um, citizens are digesting information and are forming their attitudes and opinions towards social movements. So um, for these, uh, to answer these questions, I'm using different tools, not only from the computational social science field, but also from experimental designs. Um, but Obviously, I'm going to focus here on automated content analysis that I use. Tom already mentioned the very famous convolutional neural networks that, are, that have been more accessible or that are more accessible for us social scientists now with the with transfer learning and with the idea that even with a small um, set of images, we can customize or we can tailor a largely trained um, a model for our particular objectives. So in this case, um, I, I've been using CNNs for object detection and also for the identification of violent content in the images of protests. I'm also using, and this is what most of my research has uh, focused uh, recently, which is semi-supervised methods, basically to also uh, like going back to something that Tom said, to really make the way that the tools that uh, that so that we as social scientists use, like structural topic models, like clustering, um, like things that we're familiar with, 
uh, from the from the text analysis field to translate that that language into images in a way of making it more accessible and and make it more impactful. Um, and for that, I, I I've been using visual structural topic models to identify themes, and also to test the effect of covariates on the generation of these topics that I'm equating with frames uh, from the images. And as I said, I'm also using images. Uh, in experimental designs, um, not only images as treatments uh, to see how they are affecting people's opinions, but also with this uh, philosophical question of like, what, what is an image as a treatment? What, what is really capturing? Uh, and are they, are they really portraying what we wanna say or what we wanna use as researchers in our experimental designs? So just to summarize a bit of um, the unsupervised method that I talked to you uh, about, uh, it, this, is, this is the, the workflow that I'm using to create this visual structural topic model. Um, I'm using an approach called the bag of visual words that again, like I'm pretty sure it's ringing some bells for you if you've taken the text analysis workshops, right? In which you identify key points in the images, you extract their features, um, and then you create a visual code book because unlike text in images, we don't have these words or sentences or engrams that really help us to create these uh, documentary matrix that are so helpful helpful for uh, supervised and unsupervised um, algorithms. So uh, with this workflow in which we build an image visual word matrix that emulates a document term matrix in text, we can do a lot of things like the visual structural topic model. Um, and my idea with this is that if you have a picture, for example, this one from the caravan of migrants, that it's also one of my topics and one of the themes that I love uh, studying, uh, you can have a proportion of different topics for the exact same image. So a compositional measure of, of the themes that you can find in an image. And uh, then you can compare these, these proportions of topics, and then you can analyze how, how, how different covariates are influencing the ways in which these frames or topics are being presented to the audience. Um, for, the, for, for, for CNNs and object detection, I focus generally on detecting crowds, signs, police, fires, some of these elements that give you some idea of what's happening in those pictures and what's behind the mind of the photographer or the editor who decided to publish it, and also to detect levels of violence using these pre-trained CNNs with crowdsourced, with crowdsourced tags of perceived violence. Um, and, and here uh, I can give you like a preview of the results that I generally have um, that, for example, more conservative outlets tend to tend to portray images with less groups or, or with in, in, a, in, a, in a way they are trying to minimize the magnitude of these movements uh, that are that don't align with their with their objectives. And for example, more Democrat audiences uh, tend to tend to have less nocturnal frames or less nocturnal topics. Um, so uh, I can talk more about also the effect, but this is mostly uh, some of the tools and some of the agenda that I have for my research, and I'm happy to, to, to answer any questions that you have. Okay, should I talk now? Great, uh, thank you, Tom, for uh, organizing a great event, and thank you for all the panelists sharing. Uh, okay, so I, uh, I'm going to talk about two studies I've done. Uh, hopefully, that illustrate uh, what I see as a, you know, uh, interesting thing that uh, images can do, but perhaps you know, text cannot. So, uh, so first, uh, this is a project I did uh, during my PhD, uh, where uh, me and my co-author are kind of interested in like protests in China. So for those who are not uh, that familiar with, so there, like after the Tiananmen Square, there's very few like large bigger protests, but there are a lot of like smaller ones. Like in like say 15 years ago, the government reported the number is around 85,000. And after that, the number was believed to be a lot more higher, but because you know, all the media regulations, all the you know, sanctions are what people can talk about. They're just, we don't know. We don't know what the number yet is, yeah. And it's actually caused a lot of like, uh, you know, uh, difficulty for the government to regulate such a high level of like protests. Um, but when we as a scholar want to study this event, we're actually faced with a lot of problems because like say people in the democratic countries, we usually use like say newspaper data to examine protests, but it's turned out to be very hard. So instead we focus on like Chinese social media, especially like Weibo, which is like the Chinese version of Twitter. And uh, our goal 
is to construct a large and prototypical data set so that you know, we can uh, use the data set to do some quanti quantitative analysis. Uh, yeah, this is an article uh, I mentioned. But let me talk, uh, tell you that uh, we, in the first, we try to do a tax only approach. That is, you know, you build a supervised tax classification to say, you know, these are what people talk about and whether they're about a protest, offline protest or not. But it turns out to be not a fruitful approach. And we end up adding images in and find that images are actually necessary. So why is that? So this is what we found. Like so, so for a lot of the, like the simpler, so we actually found three kind of discussions on social media. So so one type is about protests, and the other type is about you know, like mass demic is protesting this kind of word polysemy, like stuff that are totally relevant to protests, which can easily ruled out uh, using you know supervised text uh, based method. But we found out like it's actually pretty hard to distinguish protests versus grievances, which will be you know people complaining about the government and the threat to protest. Uh, you can't see a uh, action right now. But images turned out to be super helpful in that scenario to help distinguish things like very subtle, like uh, real offline activities versus just online complaints towards the government. Yeah, uh, so here's a kind of like predicts probability from our supervised image classifiers where uh, we do say that, you know, the images that have a high probability are indeed, you know, looks like protest, right? Uh, those the ones that are on the, you know, low probability ends are indeed like not relevant to protest at all. So I think there's actually lessons I learned that is actually, this is might be a, pro where a case where we do need images for our problem, like text alone is not enough. And there might be other cases which fits into the standard. But a second point I found might be interesting that images can actually be more easily transferable across cultures. Because imagine you do this, like say we, we train our tech classifier in Chinese, right? It can't be used for anything like, you know, like US or European countries, but for images, there are actually a possibility that, you know, this might be transferable across that cultures. So I think that might be a, direction that is worth exploring that if you use you know image as a data that could be easily uh, be deployed as a global scale. Okay, so that's one study I've done. And this is uh, the second study is actually a more recent one. So so we kind of realized that there are actually a lot of uh, studies on supervised image classification in the past you know five years perhaps. But there are actually not many studies on unsupervised image clustering, which is kind of surprising because you know since we have all witnesses, all the popularity of like using unsupervised text method, especially copy modeling and how great they are, right? Uh, so this is a, a current article uh, I have written with my co-author, uh, Peng Yilang, who is at Georgia, uh, uh, on the review now. So we this is a methodology article. So we basically discuss like how, uh, yeah, how we should actually do unsupervised image clustering and compare several approaches. Uh, and we didn't only use our protest data set because I have talked about chance protests. So let me show you some images of uh, the image clusters we identified uh, from the Chinese protest data. So this will be what the chance, how the Chinese protesters actually use images uh, in their protests. So the first one might actually be shocking to you because when talk about protest maps, you might imagine people are you know on the street gathering that sort of thing. But this is actually turns out to be a big uh, cluster uh, on Chinese social media as protests. This will be like people posting petition letters. And the second was actually a similar example. They're actually taking a screenshot of whatever they posted. And both of the ways actually, we found out to be a way that people, you know, avoid censorship, right? It's, it's a little bit easier for the government to delete text, pure text, but it took them a little bit more time to delete, you know, figure out what, what is in the images and delete them. Okay, so these are the two texts. Uh, relevant ones, but all the others might be kind of similar to what you have imagined, like people, uh, you know, having banners and uh, uh, voicing out their uh, uh, claims. And this will be like people actually sort of blocking the government doors and trying to force the government to help. And this will be people blocking the street, kind of disrupt social order to try to attract bystanders. And this will be, you know, the confrontation between police and the protesters. And the next one actually has some violence blood. So that will be the perhaps the more natural scenario you will imagine when you heard the word like protest. Yeah. That's a separate uh, cluster about uh, violence and blood. 
Okay, so that's a very short uh, review of what we did. And I think I want to also make two points. The first point is like in the paper, we kind of discussed, you know, uh, several different methods. And we kind of want to argue that transfer learning is actually a very good starting point for social scientists, especially if you are, you know, just in this field. Because we actually tried a lot like more complex method, like some of the cutting edge computer science method. And, and by that, we mean like we need to train by ourselves. And it takes a long, very long time and a lot of effort. And it do have a slightly better performance of the classroom, but given the technical difficulty and the, all the previous results I should actually get in from transfer learning. So we kind of think that maybe it's uh, transfer learning is a good way to start. Yeah, especially for social scientists. And after seeing all this like images of, about protests, I guess ethics is another natural question. So I'm just raising it here. But that's uh, all what I want to talk about. Awesome, thank you very much. So I, I now like to transition. I have a couple of more questions and I want to make sure we have some time at the end for uh, the audience to ask questions. Um, so now that we've heard some more about how you're using these uh, data and techniques in your research, I'd like to dig in a bit further into the practical methodological side of things. And so I'd like the, to ask the panelists to share what they think the most important skills and techniques are that interested computational social scientists should be learning. Would you like us to go in order? Uh, what's, whatever order you want it is fine. It's Fair fine. enough. Uh, yeah, so when working with video data and, and image data to some extent, um, I think the, the main tool is that you have to be pretty flexible in terms of methodology. Um, because a lot of the methodology as it currently stands has been developed for task A, and oftentimes you're trying to use it for task B. And so you have to make that transition and figure out how those things link together. Um, and so there's a lot of kind of foundational problems. Um, so with video data, the main challenge is, is that you're not just identifying, is this a person, but you're also trying to say from frame one to frame two, is this the same person? And that means that there's an added level of complexity because you have to essentially model the expected movement of that object over the duration of the video to say, are there deviations? And if the deviation is further than expected, do I say this is a new person or do I keep saying that this is the same person? And so um, methodologically, I would say that that's, that's one of the main challenges. Um, but in terms of tools, uh, I'm sure somebody else is going to talk about the wonderful world of TensorFlow, so I'll leave that to somebody else. Um, and uh, there's other tools that I use uh, that I'll put into the chat in case people are interested. Can I piggyback on, on Bryce? Uh... Uh, answer because I actually think that something that he said is that most of these things have been written in computer science, right? And it's for computer scientists. So of course, there's also like a cost of entry there, not even because the things that they are talking about are completely different to what social scientists know. I think that at the basis, all of these methods are relying on statistics, right? On, on mathematical formulas that we as, as social scientists are familiar with, but they have different names. So th there's like a cost there of like, oh, you're talking about weights and th the word weight might like throw you off. And it turns out that it's just a coefficient that you've been seeing your entire life, right? So there are like some things that are challenging there. But beyond that, um, I think that those methods, as, he, as Bryce said, have been tailored for certain objectives. And for example, when they are like developing new models for, for, for image analysis for object detection they are developing and creating new architectures of convolutional neural networks they are using always the exact same data set because they want the benchmark right and they really want to improve uh, the predictive power of that network so uh they really care about going from the 99.9 percent to the 99.90 5%. And that is less important for us as social scientists. Maybe we care more about what features of those images are, are, are like leading to a particular label, right? Or we care more about a more complex uh, data set. Um, I have a paper in, um, introducing CNNs to, 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 uh, to social scientists and we were using a textbook uh, example like detecting handwritten numbers that you literally can open any textbook of computer vision and that's going to be the iconic uh, example and they reached 
99.9% of accuracy when they are trying to predict these handwritten numbers. But they are using this super clean, amazing data set with very defined numbers. When we, Francisco Cantu and I, try to, to, to in, in, like import that model to detect uh, handwritten numbers in ballots, data set that social scientists care about, uh, the model failed completely. It, it, we just couldn't use it. And, and then that was like something that sometimes we forget because there are pre can things out there. There are a lot of things out there that are like reviewed in these computer science journals, but that we definitely need to tailor and that we need to put extra effort and combine substantive knowledge. And as Laura said, combine all other qualitative techniques that, um, that help to refine uh, these tools for what we are interested in studying. Yeah, just, just very briefly, um, the, Michelle, you mentioned this in your, your talk as well, is turning images into features is way more challenging than turning text into features and understanding what those features, like words we can understand, pixels in an image, it becomes much more difficult to say, well, it was the blue sky that caused that image to be classified in this cluster. And what does that mean to us if there's more blue sky? So in terms of tr like translating text analysis skills to images, I would say that's the biggest challenge is trying to figure out what those features mean to a social scientist substantively and and if it's classifying on the features that we find important because edge detection is huge right a lot of this image stuff is focused on edge detection which is great for object detection it's not great for this kind of substantive topics we're interested in so that translational process pixels you know the image by uh, pixel or image by feature um, matrix to like things that matter to us that is a huge challenge and i just want to put this out there again access to data. It's just, I cannot get, I'm in talks to get Instagram data, but it's just so, so hard. TikTok, how do we get access to this data? It's just, that's one of the biggest challenges for me. Uh, let me ask, I think two points. One is perhaps a little bit more practical because some of my students ask me, like, because they only know how to use R, but I think many of the transfer learning models, like especially computer scientists were mostly coding Python, right? So. I think there might be in the next maybe three or five years might be or moving into R, but at least maybe in this stage, you have to know a little bit like Python to easily get started. That's one practical suggestion. And I think a second point I noticed is like, if you are using like transfer learning, you don't need to train your model. So it's actually like very easy for people to forget that validate, validate, validate. It's always, if you like do a very standard like supervised transfer, learning model where you do have your own training data and it's easy to you know take some samples and to validate the performance but i do want to highlight that yeah if you're just using other people's models and it's actually very critical that you do validate your results okay thank you all of you um i'm sure we'll have more to discuss about the methodology in the last q a i just have one final question before we open things up um so as we've already touched upon, there are some challenges involved in this research, and it raises new ethical questions. So for example, the work of Joy Balamwini shows us how facial recognition models perform worse on darker skinned people, and particularly on black women. And Twitter users, for example, pointed out issues with its auto cropping algorithm that were recently corroborated um, by its internal data scientists. And so I'd like you to just uh, reflect on some of the ethical challenges you've encountered in your own research and how you recommend other people proceed with this type of work given these issues. Um, I wanna I'll bring just... up ImageNet and then I'll throw it over to Bryce. ImageNet oh, is what almost many, many of the transfer learning models are trained on ImageNet. But if you dig into the classification of ImageNet, it very quickly becomes very problematic. Like a homeless person is labeled as a degenerate. And you're, you, as, as Han was saying, you're using that model and you're just plopping it onto your data. Is that really what you want to be doing is applying like a label of degenerate to homeless people? But people do it without thinking. So know, your train, know what the model was trained on and look into those classification systems because they are man, it would make your brain go tizzy if you looked into that. And it's just, we need to think very carefully about just applying these transfer learning models to our data given the, the way that they're labeled it's it's quite scary alex hannah does some great work on that she's at google she does some great work on ImageNet. um so the main ethical question that i grapple with that i think will become more prominent as this type of analysis progresses is what rights do people have who are in these images 
Um, so in academic uses, it's easy to sidestep this because we're not actually using it for profit. But if you imagine uh, all the data that is being collected for self-driving cars, if you're the erratic Ford SUV that is standing in the front, that is an essential data point that allows the Tesla or others to train their uh, self-driving cars. What rights as, as a participant do you have to that IP? What rights as a participant do you have to opt out of the, those data sets? I think we've all sidestepped this because people are not aware of the extent that this data is being collected. And, I, and one thing I hope that my work will spur is people being uh, becoming aware that, oh man, like the city of New York films you 24 hours a day, for example. Um, I think that that's an important ethical question. Um, yeah, I will also would like to go back to Laura's point. I think it's, I mean, and, and as you said, Tom, it's not only about images, right? Like we live in in this world where artificial intelligence is growing and we we appreciate all the benefits that it brings us, but we also should be concerned about how we are importing our own biases to the training data that we are using to create and to like teach these algorithms how to classify and see the world, right? Like how we break this, this cycle of, of bias. So for me, that's something really important. I, I definitely agree that uh, the, like Google, for example, is taking uh, further steps to assess some of those things, uh, especially when classifying uh, race uh, in, in pictures. Some of the things that have been going are like just horrendous, into, like offensive for people in, in, in the pictures. And so far, the alternative has been to say just, okay, we're going to, for example, remove uh, some labels that are controversial, um, but but we need to, to keep going and actually involving us like this interdisciplinary work, I think it's important because as social scientists, we can also give some input on how training on a wide variety of uh, like or a more diverse pool of coders, for example, might be important. And, and going back to, to Hans' uh, point, validate, validate, validate. For me, I actually would like to talk about a particular um, ethical problem that sometimes I have with my own research. And it's like, if I'm now finding, like the implicate, and it's related to the implications of my research. Like if I'm finding now that one image is making some people sadder or making some people feel more negative about social movements, how do I deal with that implication? So people who are against social movements don't use it in, for their own advantage, right? Like to really make this implication more systematic in a way that could be used in a harmful way uh, against things that are good for the world in a way. So um, I honestly don't have an answer for that. I'm still working on, on that. I, I, I accept suggestions, but it's also something that we need to be like cognizant about when we, when we are studying these things. Uh, yeah, I think I totally agree with Laura and Michelle's point, but I want to cast a little bit more promising note because I kind of feel like uh, the images is perhaps one side that I feel like there are a lot of like biases, as you said, like in ImageNet and all the like data sets CSP are working on, but exactly because images are like, you know, so easily recognized about, by people like across the globe, like, like for you guys, you don't know what kind of context, but you have no problem recognizing all this, you know, like protesters images in like China, right? So which might be hard for like different languages, right? You have to learn understand like Chinese or understand the inter different languages to recognize what might be the biases that are embedded in the data. So in that sense, actually, I'm a little bit more optimistic about you know, identifying and perhaps ruling out, uh, not, not ruling out, but at least identifying and trying to uh, reducing the biases that are in the images compared to a variety format of text. Yeah. Uh, that's one point, uh, but uh, also I want to, because I saw there's a question in the uh, Q&A talking about my, yeah, th this like research about like protests and ethics and like whether the government might want to leverage your research to better identify and uh, oppress protesters. I don't think this is a mild question. This is a question that is happening. So this is, the government is certainly like way more technologically advanced than like we do, they carry a lot of like, and this is not only Chinese government, right? I, I feel like the government all over the world are sort of doing the sort of a similar thing where they want to hear people and uh, use different, perhaps like facial recognition algorithm to identify the protesters. And that could be a, a, you know, a new way of punishing and surveillance uh, in the digital era. And I was being asked this question a lot actually writing this research and I think my answer is pretty passive. I feel like 
the government is having way more, <laughs> way more sophisticated technology than we do. And I, 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 I can only ensure that in my own research, I don't want to, you know, do something harmful to those uh, the protesters, like doing official recognition report things and uh, or uh, uh, yeah. But I uh, yeah, I don't have a very positive answer to this question because I feel that's a general question shared by <laughs> yeah us uh, uh, around the world. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so I'd now like to open up questions to the audience. I know some of you have already been using the Q&A feature to ask some questions directly to the panelists, which is great. Um, so if you have a question, I'd like you to use the raise your hand feature, and then Megan will be able to allow you to unmute yourself. And please make sure to introduce yourself before you ask your questions so that the panelists know who they're talking to. And you're also welcome to type out questions in the chat if you prefer to do it that way. Hello. Um, I'm going to assume you can hear me. Uh, my name is Ollie. Uh, I'm a PhD candidate at the University of Oxford, uh, dabbling in um, image analysis. There are quite a few sort of treasure troves of uh, video and image data online that have originated from hacks and leaks. Um, one of the most notable recent examples being the parlor hack. Um, I was just wondering what you thought the ethical implications of using such data would be. Thanks. My opinion is to stay away. It's, it's not worth it. And, and just because we can do something and have access to data, like access to data is no joke. It's, it's a huge challenge for image analysis. And so we'd be very tempted to grab any sort of dump of images that is meaningful and analyze them. But we're academics and we, we need to stick by our kind of ethics code. And I would say it's not worth it. And sometimes we just have to say, that's, that's not a territory I'm going to. And hacks, illegal hacks that we have to be very careful of. Now there are like some scraping things that the Supreme Court has said is okay and that you know can actually lead to more good than harm, which we could border on saying that's okay. But yeah, I even even parlor, even gab, even things that we might want to just really ex expose in some ways, be be very, very cautious going that around route. But my opinion, I'm sure others have different. <laughs> No, I agree with Laura, um, especially because we also have a responsibility as teachers, right, and as professors. And um, from my personal experience as a foreign national, I really don't want to get uh, in trouble, uh, in an illegal trouble. And as Laura said, uh, even even some websites that just like uh, tell you not to scrape, or like there are like very strict uh, rules, right? So you, if you do it in a way, you're also letting your students know that you can do it, that they can do it, and uh, then it's involving or putting other people at risk. And and I think that's that's something that we need to be very cautious cautious about. Do we have any any more raised hands? There's a few questions in the Q&A if, if um, Megan or whoever you want to jump in with and let someone talk, please do. But there's some questions about data analysis, specifically my project on Instagram and Flickr and then how we access data. Uh, I am in Flickr. Uh, Instagram does have an API that you can get access to. It's taken me months and months of talks and multiple back and forth, but I'm very, very close to getting access to their API, which gives you limited access to their images, but it's there. So my plan in the future is to use that API access that I'm, I think I'm on the border of getting to do a, an Instagram study rather than a Flickr study. So start talks early if you want to get Instagram data, because you'll do a lot of back and forth. It's owned by Facebook and they're notoriously clingy about their data, but it is, it is available um, in, a, in a very straight, in a legal way, I guess, to get. And I would love to see, you know, uh, Facebook has opened up its political ad data, if we could do that with images on Instagram. So Matt, please work your magic and get them to share data with us, but it is possible. So submit an app early, for, be prepared for back and forth and, and just keep persistent at it. Just keep pushing and pushing until you can get access.
Uh, I think I, for Twitter, it's sort of similar. So their API has a, uh, I don't recall what exactly where it is, but there should be an entry where you have a link for the image they posted so that you can compile a list of images and download them all together. Yeah, so yeah, I, I've also been using mostly like social media platforms uh, APIs to get more, get my own data. And I would say, um beyond like the APIs, uh, which like definitely, I think like now the, the institutions and these organizations are way more open to collaborating with academics, uh, like Twitter, as Han says, um, but also like something that I've learned the hard way is just to ask, like the worst that could happen is that they tell you no, but like if you're interested in gathering data from a particular organization, like their images or something, just ask. Uh, and it, it's surprising that most of the times they are willing to 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 share it. So instead of like hitting your head against the wall with code, trying to get it the hard way, I, I am like that because I'm like, I, I recently told a student that I'm like, I love knowing that my code can achieve everything in the world, but sometimes an email, <laughs> it's easier and a more straightforward way of getting the information that you want. So I will, I will also suggest uh, like also reaching out to people. Um, I will quickly mention a good image and video source that um, is not social media related. So uh, I have two papers, one of which is already under review and the other is going to be at APSA that uses the Internet Archives TV news database. So if you go to the TV news archive and you search for anything and you restrict it to like Fox, CNN, MSNBC, if you type in like Donald Trump, uh, if you look at the HTML code that is behind the images that they are giving you, you will find that they give you uh, they give you thumbnails for all their videos for each minute of the video. So it's a really good way to identify images that co-occur with certain keywords, for example, and then you can analyze them using a variety of different techniques. And so the paper that we have under review, we essentially identified Anthony Fauci during the pandemic and how he appeared or did not appear in Fox News, CNN, and MSNBC. And all we used was these thumbnails that exist that are easily accessible within the internet archive. The, the Library of Congress has a great historical collection of images that's available. Photogrammer is an online tool to access those. And I love Photogrammer because they take um, transparency very seriously. So when they show clusters, for example, they show exactly what features of the images are important to each cluster. So it's a great online tool to just explore. These are historical images, but it's, it's a nice kind of intro to um, image analysis. There was also a question for open online courses. I don't know if other people know, but Python's has a book uh, on image analysis that I swear by that looks at OpenCV, that uses OpenCV. And it's a great crash course intro if, you, if you're into reading, coding, but others may know online courses that are helpful for image analysis. So I think we have a, a raised hand if you could uh, unmute yourself. Okay, cool. Um, hi, this is Ingdan. I'm a fourth year PhD candidate at Stanford University, um, working with Professor Jennifer Pan. So um, I have a question, I, and I really enjoy all the talks you gave today. I think those are very helpful. Um, I have a question related to like um, video level analysis, because I noticed that there are a lot of um, vision APIs like uh, Google Vision API and also like there's some um, um, like Alibaba API there they can help us to do some um, video level analysis um, and I, I think sometimes I struggle when um, making decision between like train uh, model on um, video classification versus like using those off the shelf um, tools. I was wondering um, what's your opinion of using those established API or um, what do you think like um, I know like validation could be a problem, but um, what do you think others um, that we should be cautious of when using those APIs? Thank you. So I'll quickly comment on the video aspect of it. Um, so, you know, like uh, the APIs, what they're going to give you is output that is, is going to be, generally speaking, probably better than what you're going to get out of a canned uh, neural network that you have in TensorFlow. Um, the video be component becomes challenging because you have to think about how do these things interact with each other over time? Like that's the big, that is the big element. And that's not necessarily 
an API and technical question. It's more of um, how do you want to model that type of data? Um, so, uh, so there's definitely uh, different ways to approach it. Um, kind of the ones that make the most sense is kind of a regime switching model, like a Bayesian regime switching model where you say, okay, this thing exists and then it changes to something else because that fits well within a video framework and the input data is going to fit nicely with what you're going to get out of an API or other image classification algorithms. Uh, the second thing I would say is that I've had great luck with aligning video and audio data. So essentially what a word alignment algorithm does, and so there's one that's called the gentle word alignment algorithm that works pretty well, is that it'll take an audio file and then it, and you give it an audio file and give you a text file. And then what it's going to give you is timestamps that are associated with those words uh, within the audio file. You can also get that within a lot of different APIs like the Google uh, speech to text API gives you that information as well. So why would you use such a thing? Well, then if you have that, then you can start saying these images appear at this point in the video. And once you have that, then the time series becomes a lot easier to work with uh, from like an object, from a simply just a time series modeling approach. And so one thing is to try to get the units as useful as possible. And so I found that kind of word level measures tend to be pretty good, especially for image data, because you can actually capture something at the word level once you have the timestamps that are associated with it. Thank you. Um, so I'm afraid we're now out of time. Uh, so I'd like to conclude this event by um, asking you all to give a big virtual round of applause for all of the panelists for being here today and for sharing their research. Um, it's been a fantastic event and um, I hope you all enjoyed it. And I'd also like to give a shout out to Megan Kang for all of her support in helping to organize this event and to Matt Salganik for organizing the SIX Festival. Um, so thank you all for attending. Uh, I'm sure some of you might want to stick around in, in the chat. We'll keep it open for a couple of minutes if there are unresolved questions. Um, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the SIX Festival.